welcome to day three of Nagios 2013 World Conference. Today we will be discussing uh, building technology for storage systems monitoring. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and give a round of applause to Thomas Dunbar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, fellow Nagios. Some of you are here, I assume, because of the storage systems monitoring, and that will be part of the focus. Storage systems monitoring is different in a couple ways. Uh, I've talked to some friends down here that I've, our friends now, uh, I hadn't met them before, they're monitoring 38,000 hosts, lots of hosts, lots of little hosts. Storage systems are generally big and expensive. They have their own instrumentation of some sort with them. Some of you are here perhaps because you read my introduction which said I'm going to talk about this as an example of a larger thing. And my discussion is going to be mainly philosophical. I'll talk about some particular Nagios points. I'll talk about how we're using Nagios within the storage group but I really want you to think about general principles and how they apply in your particular setting. Comprehensive monitoring of IT systems is a complex problem. It's, they're not easy solutions and there are no solutions that work for everyone, I think. Just yesterday, completely separate really from IT, uh, in the Wall Street Journal there was this little thing. The provision of health care is an, an inherently local endeavor, and it increasingly appears that so is applying health insurance. It's a local endeavor. Now, local for us, ladies and gentlemen, may be spread across the world. You may be monitoring things that are all over the world, but it's still local. It's local to your organization. Uh, somebody asked me, was I a storage person? Not really. Uh, let me categorize us as one of three things. Geeks, managers, and messengers. Geeks are people that have technical expertise. They get their job satisfaction from building things, from fixing things. Managers manage resources. The primary resource is people. Okay? Messengers, you, don't, you hear geeks and managers are maybe phrased differently, but you don't often hear messengers. But in any organization of any size, there start to be communication problems. And so there are some people within your organization, they may be not labeled that way, that their primary job is to communicate between this group that looks at things one way and that group that looks at things another way. And that's what I am within Intermountain Healthcare. The storage group helped me, uh, hired me to help them better support the DBA group. So I, I go in meetings in both and you know, say, well, these folks are complaining about this and go back and forth between the two. Uh, you'd sort of, it, sometimes people think of that as, I, uh, as project management, really it's not that. So I'm a messenger. Building technology is sort of redundant, really, right? Because technology is about building stuff. I'm not looking at building um, a replacement for the brocade network advisor. I'm not interested in building a replacement for IBM Smitty, th their interface. Uh, we're looking at monitoring these things. The advice that you get at the beginning, when you first get into Nagios, the sort of beginner guide says, relax, this is going to take a while. That's good advice. And read the documentation. That's very good advice. The first reference is if you're interested in Intermountain's approach to healthcare, which is an outcome based. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Brent uh, James has been very influential in taking uh, things related to process management, uh, Edwards Deming, and, and applying that, saying, okay, you come in with a certain set of symptoms. 
and you get treated a certain way. Somebody else gets treated a different way. It's surprisingly various how people get treated. You know, which is better? And applying that. Well, that needs a comprehensive healthcare system where you've got the hospitals and the insurance and all that stuff tied in together. And that's what Intermountain Healthcare has. So that's, that's a reference for that. Now, I give us or read their documentation. Then once, as you're reading their documentation, if you, if you get anything else, uh, this book by Jacobson, if you don't know it, certainly look at it. I think it's the very best book on Nagios, not to replace the documentation, but to supplement the documentation. He was a presenter here last year, I think, and at, at other times. But it gives a very good high-level overview of what needs to be talked about. Uh, Unix monitoring environment, I'm going to come back to that when I talk about clarity. Uh, but, and the, the others are uh, about worldview and some other things that we'll come back to in a little bit. I'm actually planning to zip through, I've only got 12 slides, I don't like slides. I, I, I want to talk with you and I want to engage uh, and we'll go through these twice. Uh, Intermountain Healthcare is a pretty big company. Not a big company in some sense, okay? And we're not an IT company, although IT is crucial. And if you looked at my mail address, you saw it was thomas.dunbar at imail.org, which sort of gives you an idea, hum, how did they grab that so soon? So they must have at least thought, oh, well, the internet is important. Let's, let's grab something before somebody else grabs it. The I there means Intermountain, not internet. Because it's a large company, we, can, we have the money to spend on various things. Uh, we're, we use Nagios not because it's cheap, but because it does things that other things can't do. We're also a very much high, avail high availability company. We don't want to have any downtime, no downtime. If a particular product, if a firmware upgrade on it means that there's a two second downtime, then it's not ready for production, as far as we're concerned. We want no downtime. Uh, we have data centers in Salt Lake, in Plano, Texas, running in a Dell data center, and then up 30 miles in Ogden. Uh, in fact, tomorrow, the main system that, that handles the OLTP, the, the main day-to-day -day business transactions, it's being switched from Ogden down to Salt Lake. There's some question about whether that really helps us with disaster recovery. I was talking with a gentleman beforehand about the importance of disaster recovery. And you, when you switch things, when you've got multiple places that you can run your business from, that helps you with disaster recovery. But still, if one goes down and the other's still up, who knows? Friday, we were up at McKay, and we were doing a, a cable audit because we're switching from some old McData switches, seven-year-old McData switches, which are probably better than the, Mc, than the brocade, but we're replacing them with Cisco just because we want a certain amount of a variety in there. And as we were doing the, the, the cable audit, we wiggled one cable, and actually the cable, uh, we lost, we, we dropped a connection. And it was actually just, wouldn't you know, we, we, we wiggle 180 cables, and the one we wiggle that has a problem is actually the CDR system, the main system that we're using. Um, but everything is dual path that we're doing, so you knock down one path and it doesn't knock it out. Nagios is used at our group currently by the SAs, especially the open system SAs. Uh, Select Health, uh, that arm uses it. But the main focus of the organization is away from Nagios. In fact, when I said I wanted to put in a Nagios server for storage, uh, system monitoring, I got a good bit of pushback and I still get a good bit of pushback from management and from good corporate citizens in the SA group saying, well, we're moving away from Nagios. Why, why would you want to put in a new Nagios server? And I'll explain to you why, uh, in spite of the fact that we're using service desk and uh, Spectrum. Spectrum, it, it, this, this is one of these big expensive tools uh, that has very pretty graphics uh, that claims to deal with what the organization wants to deal with, to have an end-to-end -end view of everything 
with being able to drill down, being able to look at root cause analysis, do capacity planning. Uh, the extent to which it can do that, I'm, I'm not saying that it can't. Um, it's just that that's what we're using. The organization has decided to use that overall. What I want to do is I want to make sure that our local, that our small storage group, that the on-call guys have what they need. The, the overall system wasn't built for them, but at the same time I want to feed into that. So it, that, the particular, our particular local use of Nagios is related to meeting on-call needs for the hardware that we're concerned with on the one hand, and feeding into a completely different monitoring system on the other. That probably is a little bit different from the way a lot of y'all are using things. Um, I actually start, we haven't, my personal involvement with this is fairly recent. First I, I pulled down the 4.0 core, it was still beta at that time, um, and got that up and we were actually using that for a couple months and then as, as we got closer to we're actually putting things in production, I really had to think about, well, do I really want 4.0? Do I really need 4.0? There's some little things in four, just, just minor things that I think are really, really useful and important. To give you just one little tiny example, you know in 3.5 and earlier, and all the stuff that I say about 3.5, it also applies to XI, of course. There's a directive, there's a parents directive for hosts, but not for services. And I really, I really like that that I want to specify the parent-child. It's an easy way to do dependencies. And although I can force it just with host, I like it with services too. That's true in 4.0. There's a significant performance improvement in version 4. I don't actually need that because I'm not monitoring 38,000 things. I'm monitoring a few things that are complex and that have lots of interrelationships rather than a lot of things. I, I put DNS on, DNX on here, but if we ever need that for our group, and we probably won't when we go to four, uh, I don't think we'll even need it, but we probably use Mod Dearman instead. Uh, but that's really not our focus. Speaking of complexity, let's back up just a minute. You or your parents or somebody are on multiple medications. If you pick up the documentation that you got from the pharmacy, it will tell you, okay, don't, uh, if you take this medicine, don't do this. These are maybe the side effects, right? Some of you or some of your parents or somebody are on multiple medications. Where do you get the documentation about the interaction between this medicine that really is crucial, and this medicine is crucial. You don't get it anywhere. Suppose there are three medications. Suppose you're on some, and they have significant interactions. Where do you read about those interactions? You don't read about them anywhere. As systems interrelate, monitoring the effects of one thing, that's hard, Monitoring the, the binary effects of lots of things, that's harder, but it's the multiple effects that's really hard. Do we have any people in here with a physics background? Okay. If you take three objects and wanted to know the gravitational interaction between the two, that is an unknown problem. It's really a math problem, not a physics problem. We do not know how by the laws of gravity to predict how a baseball, a bowling ball, and that book are going to interact if they were in uh, an empty space and just gravitationally react, interacting. We do a lot of binary things and all, it, it's just like in, in math where you reduce everything to a linear problem. You can locally approximate it about, like that. It's the interactions that are complicated. Let me give you another example. In Salt Lake where I live, 
It's rapidly grown. And the highway system was built, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Well, right there in Salt Lake, there got to be a big problem with traffic jams of people couldn't get on the on-ramp several places. And it was very busy, and there, the, the city looked at it and said, okay, well, we'll fix this. So they fixed those on-ramps. Now, that, think of that as a monitoring problem. Okay? They saw a problem. The monitoring system said, here is a problem. So they went and solved it. They fixed those on-ramps. So what happened? Well, instead of having traffic jams, instead of having bottlenecks where the, the people that were bottlenecked were going 20, 30 miles an hour, down the road on I-15, about 15 miles down the road, where they were going 70 miles an hour, they had a bottleneck. It made things worse. And you probably know that from your own case. You can have, you can have a system say that uh, maybe you've got a two, two, gigabyte, two gigabit fiber network in there, and that's acting as a throttle. And you take that and you replace it by an eight, and all of a sudden, these two servers that before could just get 2% each of the system can now get 50% or something. And actual performance goes down because you made an improvement. Those are examples not related to IT. Well, the last one sort of related to IT. To show that monitoring of things is a complex thing where the interactions are a real problem. It's just, if you're in storage, you're using big expensive things. If you're storing lots of stuff. Uh, when I gave my little abstract for this talk, I said we have it had over four petabytes of storage because we were under four and a half. I like to round things. Uh, now we have just over five, and that's only four months away. That's uh, really hard to manage when you've got that much storage. But that also means that we have expensive equipment. You would think, I would think, I don't, I don't have a long background in, uh, in storage. I would think when I pay a million dollars for a piece of hardware, it would come with good uh, instrumentation. Wouldn't you think that? And was I just naive in thinking that? But it doesn't necessarily. Uh, just to, not to pick on anybody in particular. Uh, brocade uh, fiber channel switches, for example. You, you want to know about various errors. Well, you can have 16 or 17 various errors that can be thrown. What happens when an error gets thrown? It sets a flag. Ah, oh, I've had an error. Well, that's not what I need. What I want is I want to know, I want to trend on those errors. Because there are going to be some errors that are just going to automatically happen that they don't really mean a problem. Somebody's connected on the fiber channel, and they drop their connection. They don't drop it politely. They just turn something off. Well, that throws a flag. The brocade switch says, I've had an error. It only gets resolved when I reset that. It doesn't tell me anything at all. What I need is, I need at least a counter on how many errors are I getting, am I getting over time. And what I really need is for this particular error, count, tell me how many errors I've got. Then I could track it. Speaking of tracking, I'd also want to know, well, what's going on over time? Well, an expensive uh, fiber channel switch or even a stand, sand storage device it doesn't keep track of statistics for very long. So you also want to know th about things over time. Because after all, this is expensive equipment that you spend a lot of money on for it not to fail. You expect it to stay up for years. You expect major modifications of firmware not to take anything down. You expect it to stay there, so you want, and you also need statistics over time because so that relates to the monitoring of these sorts of things. It's not so much we're concerned about failures. It really is trends that we're interested in to a large extent. Some, some things that you're monitoring, you really want to know when they go down. Here, it's long-term trends that are really the more important issue. Uh, this is just the sort of hardware that we have. At least we have right now. They're, there are complex reasons that we may be going away from IBM. We may be switching to something else. But. Building IT things is a complex task. We haven't been, we, the human race, we've not been doing that for really very long. 
There are existing systems that came online, so to speak, within our lifetime that are still there. Uh, air traffic control systems. Uh, at Intermountain, our own healthcare system, our, our IT was done, made locally. And it's different from most of the rest of the world. We were a little bit ahead of the curve, and the doctors, there were doctors that were also IT um, aware, and they said, okay, we're going to build a system for us, for the doctors. We're not going to base it on, we're not going to base the data structures on patient history, which is really, really, when you get down to it, it's really for the benefit of accounts receivable. It's not for the benefit of you patients. Well, I mean, the doctor, the, the hospitals do want to provide, and, and they, they do want to care for people, but the structure, the data structure, the patient history, that really is not primarily for the patient. What the doctor needs is if you come in and you've, you're, very ill, you have a bunch of symptoms. The doctor would like to know, given these specific symptoms, there may be 30 indicators. That's more than any, the most brilliant, you know, Dr. House cannot cope with 30 indicators. Okay. But the system can, it can say, okay, with these 30 indicators, this treatment is twice as effective as that treatment. Now, we would like the doctor to know that and be able to say, well, okay, but in this case, I observed this, so I'm not going to do that. But at least we'd like the doctor to have that information. So at Intermountain Healthcare, the basic data structure is the treatment event. And there are reasons for that. There's reasons for that to give the doctor the most help they can get in doing the treatment. That said, Intermountain is probably going to shift away from that system because it's a large, complex system. It's old. It needs to be replaced. It was made back before the day that government regulations were so complicated to deal with, and it may well be that we're going to go to a, a big commercial system and lose a competitive advantage because we were not able to change this large, complex system for a variety of reasons. So all that is really an introduction to say what we want to look at is what are we trying to do? Our culture, the Western culture, have generally looked at things through a scientific worldview that goes back centuries. I'd argue it goes back to the 12th century. century. But uh, the, the scientific worldview, namely, what can we know and how do we know it? That's been the dominant worldview in the West for a long time. A technological worldview has not. The word technology actually according to the Webster's Dictionary I looked at recently, it was first used in 1859. Now, there's been technology a long time before that. Technology just means, I mean, technos is art, skill, making stuff. It's been around for a long time, but only with being able to make virtual machines. That's what we're doing. We're, in IT, we're making virtual machines with software and with hardware. That's when technology really took a big jump and we are at the beginning of having a comprehensive technological worldview. By a worldview, I mean something that's big enough that you don't really see it. It helps you to figure out how to solve problems because everything is sort of organized to answer that sort of question. I also say, sort of jokingly, a worldview is something that's big enough for us to think that's the only way to look at things. And we want to be careful that we don't make the same mistake that the scientific worldview. Well, that's the only way to look at things. Well, no, it's not. A worldview is something that's, that the way you look at things, and it helps you to look at those things, but it may not be the only way to look at things. Context is something that exists within a worldview. Part of the problem of our monitoring is people want to look at the same things in a different context. If you're an on-call person, you have a certain way that you're looking at the servers. If you're upper management, you have a completely different way that you're looking at the servers. And you have different questions that you're wanting to answer. Now we're really getting started to, well, how do we build technology, just in general? Well, the first thing that occurs to me is, does growth count as building? 
For my purposes, it does. Um, some, when we talk about building things, you think of houses, you think of, there, that's technology, but also our economic system, that's a technology, or I like to think of it as a technology. The English language is a technology. It's a technology that has grown rather than being consciously built. Well, maybe Shakespeare was consciously building the language, but most of us are just using it in an awkward sort of fashion. So I'm really going to argue for a model that focuses more on growth than planning. But all, it, there's an interesting thing that happens. Suppose you're building a shed out in the back of your house. You, you sort of work in your mind about how you're going to do it. And then you go build it. Suppose you're going to build a four-story apartment complex in the heart of your city. You wouldn't do it that way. You'd have an architect, several architects, structural engineers, several structural engineers. You'd plan it. As things get bigger, they need planning. They need coordination of various resources. But suppose things get really bigger. Suppose you're talking about the economic system of a country. Over the past 50 years or so, we've had a pretty good example that planned economies don't do very well. We just do not have the toll, no person, no small group of people have enough information to where they can do the planning. So instead you have little inputs from lots of people and you would like to maximize those inputs from people that have localized expertise and put them together. Now, of course, I'm sort of, uh, that's an Austrian economic model that I'm giving you, and you may disagree with that. But, but I'm, I'm saying that as things get really big, the way you build stuff in general is by maximizing the inputs from lots of local expertise. And that's what I want to do with Nagios. If I was using it in a big, if it was everything that I was doing, I would really emphasize that. I would make sure that everybody, this whole thing of auto discovery, I think, wait a second, something's wrong here. Are these nations that are at war that you have to auto discover what systems you have? Every piece of hardware in your organization Somebody's the primary SA for it, or maybe SA isn't the right word. But somebody has primary control over that piece of equipment. I would like to take every SA and make them organize into my system. You might say, oh, well, that'll be chaos. How can you manage? How do you keep things from getting corrupted? Use something like Git to coordinate that and work out your data structures and your directory hierarchy so that the people that have responsibility for this set of Linux servers, there's a certain template they use. Uh, inside that directory, you have an individual file for each one of the servers, and those individual files are not really, they're automatically generated. You've got a list from a, uh, you've got the template, you've got a list of servers that this particular SA is managing and he's responsible for, and then you have a little script that goes through and generates for this server, use the template, then substitute the name of that server in, then post-process with some particular thing that you may need for that server. And then manage that all in a Git uh, framework or some other thing that you're managing the code with. How many, when you're building something in general, how many, I've already talked a little bit about the number of inputs, but how many inputs do you want to have? And I'm arguing that the more inputs, the better if they're well managed. When you buy an expensive product like CA Spectrum, you're really reducing the number of inputs. You're saying this system, this comprehensive thing that's been built, uh, we don't have confidence in our own ability to build it, so we're going to buy this or, or maintain it, so we're going to buy this real expensive thing that winds up taking a lot of support if it's going to work well and still going to need some individual inputs. How much personality do you want your system to have? Well, it's going to have to have at least a couple personalities because they're different uses for your monitoring system. How to deal with that is there are various ways to address it. Now, here's the core. I'm going to argue that 
for lots of building in general and building our sort of systems that there are three things that are important for us to bear in mind. Maybe not the only three things. One of them is coherence. How do things fit together? It's interesting that the word coherence has two sort of different uses. Uh, something, things cohere if they fit together. But if a talk is incoherent, it means it's not understandable. Isn't that interesting? Understandability is connected with fitting together. We want our systems to be coherent. If they're not coherent, if they don't fit together, they're going to incline to fall apart over time. When we're building things, we're not building from scratch. We're fitting things together. Oftentimes, they're pretty large things. It may be that you're fitting together a group of servers. It may be that you're fitting together a instrumentation package for, say, a brocade uh, uh, switch with an existing uh, monitoring structure. You're, you're sort of saying one thing is instrumentation on itself, but I'm needing to fit it together with other things. When you make, when you're making expensive, when you, when somebody is making expensive hardware and you're de designing the instrumenta instrumentation, you're designing the instrumentation for that piece of hardware. You're not really, and you, you want that hardware to, to be used in a certain way, so, so it's meant to connect together. But Brocade, IBM, EMC, when they're making their hardware, they're wanting the hardware to fit together. Their primary focus, or even their secondary focus, is not making the instrumentation for that hardware to fit together. They, it's hard for them even to know how to do that. How would you make your instrumentation fit together? Well, what is it fitting together with? There's no, there are not that many standards. I mean, there are standards, SNMP and, and you know, various things, but, but a lot of the building is going to have to be done by us. So you want to make sure that things are fitting together. Now, fitting together is also not just of the various software pieces. Your organization itself, for it to be successful, it has to fit together well. If upper management is going one way and the staff is saying, well, no, that's, that's just, they don't know what they're doing, we're going another way, your organization isn't fitting together and it's not going to benefit. Okay? It can go the other way too. It, all, all the parts of the organization hopefully are helping one another, are being mutually supportive, but they have different roles. We want our software to fit together. We want our monitoring system to fit together because, so that it doesn't fall apart, so it doesn't break, so that it helps everybody. This uh, fitting together is a, a big thing for me because if you remember what I said about being a messenger, you're communicating with different groups. You're helping the groups fit together because they have a different perspective. So you say, well, you're looking at stuff this way, but another group is looking at stuff that way. When we're wanting things to fit together, just in general, we want to make sure that we don't uh, become too confident in our own abilities in the sense that, okay, well, you're looking at stuff this way, you're looking at stuff that way, but me, I who know more than you, I am going to take your two views and say, well, this is the way you should look at it. When really, I don't fully understand this group or this group. Whenever we're trying to pull together different worldviews, we want to make sure that we don't too rapidly think that we understand either and create our own different perspective that really isn't as good as either one of these. That applies to how we build our systems too. Clarity. By clarity, I mean, well, let me go back to the Kernigan and Ritchie book. How many of you know that book, Unix uh, Program Environment? When I first read that, I didn't know much about computing. I thought, oh, I understand. It makes sense. 
By clarity, I mean sort of the opposite side of coherence. Coherence is how things fit together locally. Clarity is how things fit together globally. It's sort of related to mathematical elegance, perhaps, or artistic beauty. When, when you look at something, a building, a person, uh, a painting, it's, it's clear, by its clarity, I mean it just strikes you that, oh, this is, I understand it. I understand what's going on here. Clarity does not mean simplicity. You're building a comprehensive monitoring system. Your company has a mission, and they probably have a mission statement. But really, if your company is successful, it has a clarity about what it's going to do that can't be summarized in a, in a few words. Uh, the short story writer Flannery O'Connor said one time, a short story is meant to say something that can't be said any other way, and it takes every word of the story to say what that meaning is. Now, that's maybe an over-exaggeration, but that's the point I want to make. If a skilled artist, when they're doing something, every part of the, of the concerto, every part of the sonnet, it's meant to fit together. And a, a critic that says, well, what Shakespeare was trying to say was, well, that's just arrogant nonsense. Okay. Shakespeare, I have to assume, said exactly what he meant to say. Bach wrote exactly what he meant to write. And I'm, uh, a critic maybe should try to help to understand. But, so clarity is important to look at the other way for how things fit together. Because when we're making things, if I, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with putting together these two pieces of my monitoring system. Somebody else is maybe concerned with putting together two other pieces of the monitoring system. Well, we're both concerned about putting things together but across the whole spectrum of this big system we're building, if we're just concerned about coherence, we can have shifting to where, oh, wait a minute. Here we were concerned about this, but by the time we got over here, each of these things individually fit together reasonably well, but the entire thing doesn't fit together very well. Which gets to the third thing, continuity. We are building things in time. One of the big differences between a technological worldview and a scientific worldview is a technological worldview is embedded in time. Scientific theories, even ones that, that relate to time, evolution or relativity, they're really sort of timeless. You're sort of looking at, well, here's the space-time continuum, and you're outside of it looking at it. But when you're building stuff, it has to be built within time. There's a time when you're starting it, and there's a time when it's going to die, sad to say. But that's going to happen. Uh, Scott McNeely, who used to be the head of Sun Microsystems, he used to say, when you're looking at total cost of ownership, you're wasting your time unless you include the cost of exit. Because whatever the product is that you're thinking about buying, or the system that you're expending for, it might not be a product you can easily buy, whatever you're putting in place, there's going to become a time when you just can't modify it. You're going to have to replace it. If you don't factor in that cost, it's not realistic. Well, companies like Microsoft, Oracle, all none of those people want to hear that thing. But we need to hear it because our primary concern is not just building a large comprehensive monitoring system. We're wanting to benefit the organization that we're working for. If you build your system so it and you haven't kept in mind that it's going to need to be replaced sometime, you're being irresponsible. If you build the system so only you can maintain it, you're being very irresponsible and your boss shouldn't let you do that. Part of the reason that Nagios is appealing uh, for geeks like me, or at least former geeks like me, I like config files. I like text files. It's just nice for me to work with but they also have advantages in self-documentation. You want to organize your configuration files, you want to organize how you work with them so that if you and your coworker, God forbid, died in a traffic accident tomorrow, other people could take over your system. 
it's real common to say, well, I don't have time to do this right. You don't have time to do it wrong. I'm not saying to spend a lot of time in preparation. I'm just saying keep in mind continually that you want your system to be able to survive you. You want your system to be able to survive it's replaced entirely. You would like to embed the understanding of the operational interconnections and significances of the things you're monitoring in your files as much as possible. You would like to, it, not embed it inside, inside some closed program. Well, you can't embed it inside a closed program in Nagios, but you also can make it so it's not very comprehensible for other people. Uh, there are Nagios products, uh, the uh, business process, what's the I stand for? Something, you know, that, that will sort of help that. But you don't need, I'm sorry? Intelligence. Intelligence, right. You can also make that on your own. Nagios doesn't really talk about it a whole lot, but there's no reason that a host has to be a real host, you know. It could be a virtual host. We're, we're familiar with VMs and things. There's no reason that a host can't be a database or maybe even an application running on top of the database. You're monitoring stuff. As long as, as long as it's something that you can say, well, how do I tell that this thing is alive? Um, you can, if you want to, you can think of it as a virtual host. I'm inclined to think that I want, or, or you've already heard me say that, in my opinion, you ought to have a separate file for each object, for each, for each host for sure. Services, well, probably that too. But, but for each host, uh, and then group them. Group them in directories. Um, group them in a way that, helps in your management of them, but also helps in the comprehension of how these things are structured. That becomes, that becomes difficult when you have complicated in relationships, of course. The, at Intermountain Healthcare, in my mind, the, the fundamental issue that we have is how to meet the needs of the disparate groups, of the upper management needs and the, uh, the people that are maintaining the software, uh, the software themselves, the on-call people. I must admit I thought this amusing. No longer responding to primary management requests. This is the, the big expensive software that it was saying, well, it, it couldn't get the SNMP trap that it needed. Uh, and uh, actually, Nagios wasn't having any trouble with this at the time. But um, we, the, it, we want our monitoring system to meet the needs of the people it's meeting. And our company wouldn't have bought this, spent a lot of money on this, if there weren't some needs that, it, that need to be met, that it thought that was the best way to meet it. What I'm trying to do, what I'm want, going to do, is to use Nagios to help the larger system meet that needs, meet those needs. Down the road, well, let me, let me not get there yet. So, in particular, how do you do that? Well, any large monitoring system is going to have a variety of ways to feed information in. Uh, in particular, what we're going to do is to take the spectrum agent, put it on the Nagios server, and then have it look at log files. That if, if there's some, well, let me back up a little bit. There's some complicated process that we need to monitor. Uh, we set up a way in Nagios to monitor, uh, not to page people at the middle of the night if it's not production, to have different rules for, for whom they page when. We set it up. In on the developed Nagios server the way we want. And as we're doing that, we contact the, the CA Spectrum group and say, here's something we need monitoring that's not currently monitored. Can you put it in? Uh, yeah, we can do that real easily. OK, fine. We'll stop right there. No, it will take us a while. OK, we'll put our Nagios thing into production and say, OK, we've got this in Nagios now. We know that Nagios is not the, the organizational uh, monitoring system of choice. But we're doing this to meet our on-call immediate needs. We're also pushing that the other system, the, the system that Nagios is, is integrating with, we're pushing it to say, OK, we can do it here. 
you, you say that you can do this, actually do it. Do it in your system. Uh, it's easy enough to integrate the two things uh, through log files. You, we could also send uh, messaging somewhere else, but the log files is an easily historically documentable way to connect those things. As I said, for storage systems, we're dealing with large, reliable pieces of hardware. If something goes wrong, they call home immediately. Um, they're, they're designed not to break. They're also, though, not very well designed to have good instrumentation. Uh, if any of you have large SAN servers, uh, you've probably run into, unless you, unless you don't stripe things across the same group of disks, you have one group that they've striped across 80 disks. You've got another group that they've striped across 40, and you've got 20 disks that are shared by these two systems. The, the big main SAN vendors, they don't really give you very good software to deal with, well, what's contending with what? 2 a.m. in the morning, your data warehousing group uh, notices all of a sudden some significant performance degradation. You talk to the SAs, they say, oh, everything looks fine to us. We can't tell. Uh, you say, well, is there some storage contention? Well, I don't know. We can't tell. The, 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 the abstract, well, in theory, it's computer science. You could tell. It's, you, you could, but it's very complicated. The, the stuff isn't there very well. You happen to be at, a, uh, at lunch sometime, and you hear somebody from the network group talking about some Oracle testing you're doing. You think, oh, when are you doing that testing? Oh, between 1 and 3 a.m. Hmm. We're actually, you're the ones we're contending with. You would expect that when you spend millions of dollars on uh, some SAN storage that they would have instrumentation for doing that, but they often don't. The ultimate need, the, the really thing that I want to go to is dealing with correlation. Dealing with, okay, across the entire organization, how I would like to be able to do some sort of data mining to say, well, okay, I don't even know of a specific problem, but are there some correlations of slowdown that are not so egregious, that they're not so obvious that I see them right away, but that really I could dramatically improve the system. Now there's some expensive, uh, I'll mention a, a product that I, uh, expensive purchase product that I think is worthwhile. Uh, Virtual Instruments looks at the sand fabric layer. It involves some of the complications of maintenance by just looking at the sand fabric layer. It doesn't look at the objects on top of it. So you put taps in, uh, and then you could actually see the flow of traffic. You say, well, are we actually using both ports just as well? There are complicated things that you can do. It's limited in what it can do, but it, it avoids the problem of, well, how do I maintain compatibility with all this hardware that is changing its drivers? And that, you know, it's just, it's not financially rewarding for me to make software like that. But, but if I collect, say, with a, uh, uh, PN, PNP for Na, uh, Nagios and the RRD, which is really, the, that's the core. It's the RRD tables underneath. If I collect data for a long time, then I would like to be able to data mine inside it and say, hmm, there's this correlation here, this complex correlation. And there are going to be complex correlations that are going to probably require really significant statistical tools to sort of see things. But you're not going to be able to do that at all unless you collect the data. Uh, so I, you know, I want to reserve a terabyte or so, um, at least, for collecting data on things so that over time, down the road, I can see. And I also want to test to make sure, well, I'm going to be summarizing. Is the information that I need going to get summarized out to where I don't even see it? I want to make sure that the information, well, I don't really know what information I'm going to need. but to the best of my ability, I want to make sure that the information I will need to detect correlations that are degrading corporate performance as a whole are, I have the information that I need so that I can say, here's the problem. This group of servers doing this sort of thing uh, are overloading 
the, well, this is going to be too simple. This is something you don't really need this for. But uh, our overloading uh, our uh, tape backup storage, so we're taking too long on the tape backup, and that's causing this degradation uh, because, well, we actually could, could drop an Oracle server because we're running out of uh, the archive log space. That's a simple sort of thing. But the complex relationships that we can find in that fashion. Thomas, uh, looks like we have uh, reached uh, the end of the session here. Um, we can uh, pause for uh, any quick comments or questions uh, for him right now, or, and I'm sure he'll, he'll be around uh, throughout the day if anybody has any uh, further questions yes, like please. to talk about. I much but prefer conversation to talking. But uh, any quick questions? All right, well, thank you for your time. Thank you.